Hey guys, I'm back. I was going to talk a little bit about, um, oh, let me tell you what happened today. Gosh, you know, I, ooh, maybe a year or so, when I first started making videos, I was talking about how my neighbor, and uh, he's a young guy, but man, we have been going through with this music thing, so I've been, we have talked about it several times, and I got the office involved. And for the past three weeks, he's been so nice with his music. Just beautiful. So nice until I even stuck a note in his door telling him how much I appreciate him keeping the music down. I mean, I said, keep up the good work. And today, all day long, he's been banging that music. And I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And, uh, well, before I bammed on his, on the wall, I took me some Tarzana thing. Come here, come here. Don't get, get up here. You're getting too busy. Come on. <sighs> come on. So, anyway, I took some Tarzana thing so I could just ignore it because I wanted to watch some Netflix. I'm sitting here in the living room. I can't even be in my living room with the music. I'm so loud. I took Tizanidine, and that makes me sleep for about three hours. How come when I wake up, I hear, still hear this loud music? Ooh, mama went cuckoo. I got <laughs> dents all on the wall from bamming, and I screamed as loud as I could. I almost passed out for screaming, telling him about that music. But he rushed over here. I mean, in less than a minute, and we were talking through the door, and I said, um, come on in the house, it's too cold for you to be um, talking through the door like that. Uh, and talking through the door like that. But anyway, uh, he came on in the house, and we got a whole lot of stuff straightened out. I mean, it was good that we were able to talk together and figure out stuff. I mean, it was, he stayed about 15 minutes, and I really enjoyed it, and he said, uh, Miss Mary, I was doing so much better, and I mean, I got A's. I said, yeah, you messed up, didn't you? So, now you know. And he asked me which day could he have. I said, well, I understand when you have company that you, um, you know, have to do that. Mm. But don't turn up that loud. I understand when you got company. And I look out the window, I can tell when you got company. But um, and then I told him, it was so funny. I told him, and I said, my brother said, said to me, he said, Mary, you know how it is. You done forgot. Because, you know, I could smell the weed between the, you know, the walls. He said, my brother said, yeah, that boy smoking that weed. And you remember how we used to do? You take a puff, turn the music up loud as you can, and then fall asleep. Wake up, take a puff again. And I, I said, oh, shoot, I forgot. That's the way. <laughs> so, but still, you know, when we were puffing and, Puff, puff, giving and all that. We were in a house. You can't do that in apartments, you know. But I told him I understood. And uh, if, uh, you know, if I could, if I really could, would, but I can't because of pain management. Because marijuana is a better source of pain management than these opioids. And the doctors and the scientists, they know this. But I don't know why they want to keep everybody addicted that's what they want and when if you're addicted to weed that's being that's like addicted to food something natural so how are you going to be addicted to marijuana and it's a natural thing so if i could i would but this boy does have some good smelling weed. Wow, I, I get my hats off to that. It it brings back woo wee memories. <laughs> so, but anyway, oh, I know something else I was going to talk about. Earlier, 
uh, last Saturday when it was, I started this prep to do a colon osteophy. Boy, that was a rough one. I couldn't eat from Saturday until Monday. Oh, that was rough. Saturday evening. So, but anyway, when I was in there getting ready to do the colostrum, I'm in the, not, uh, yeah, do the, the test. The room is dark and you could see the screen. So, you already got the thing in your arm, the IV, and all they need to do is give you this uh, anesthesia. So, they tell me to roll over on my left side. And when I rolled over, no, before I rolled over, it was this funny looking guy, just funny looking. And he was just talking and I told him, I said, I don't have my glasses on and I can't see your face. I said, so it, I just hear noise. But he was from he was from Kentucky and it was just his country. And he says, uh, you know, I smoke weed and blah, blah, blah. And he just kept going on. But he kept leaning on me while I'm on the, the stretcher, the gurney, and he just pushing, and I said, oh, why, what are you doing, but he kept on pushing, and by the time I, uh, he said, well, I'm trying to get you to roll over to your left side, so I said, well, help, help me, don't help me like that, so they pulled the pad and slid me over, but he kept, seemed like he pushed on my ribs more, and next thing I know, I was feeling this IV getting hot, and I was in and the medicine going in, and next thing I know, I'm back in my room. So they they taking blood pressure, make sure I'm uh, coming out of the anesthesia. So I said, oh, oh, that was a man, and I told him what his name was. I said, he was weird. And and they said, was it so-and-so and so-and-so? So -and -so? I said, yeah. I said, he's country. He tells me like he's from the country. And they said, yeah, he is. I said, well, why was he? pushing and leaning on me. I said, I really didn't like it, but it wasn't nothing I could do. And she, this is what the nurse tells me. Now, I, I find it unbelievable, but she said he's pushing on you to get your intestines to move in the empty cavities from where your womb used to be. I said, where my womb used to be? He said, she said, yeah, you've had a complete hysterectomy. I said, yeah. So she, he said, she said, we knew that by looking at the paperwork. So we do that so the intestines will flow and the camera won't bind up. I said, for real? She said, yeah. I said, you, you telling me stories? She said, no, no, Miss, Miss, Miss Mary, we're not. We're telling the truth. I said, well, I've had. Uh, Four colonostrophies, and I and I never, re I don't remember nothing like that. She said, "Well, we learn every every day. We learn what we need to do to make our job more uh, efficient." I said, "Okay," but <laughs> that was kind of mind boggling. But this guy was talking about how good his weed is, and he says he buy. Uh, weed at a service station in Dallas and I said I didn't I didn't know you could buy weed like that in Dallas and I thought I said man he just lying I think he was just trying to cuz hell I, I no you can't weed no you can't do that in Dallas not in Texas you know Texas ain't about to do that but I think that was part of his job to uh, talk to me so I wouldn't notice how he was pushing on my side and, and getting too close because he really I remember that part I wasn't under that much but I didn't uh, know he was pushing on me but anyway I went through that and got that done so I did an MRI the, the same week and then we did the colon ostrich so everything's good pretty pretty clean colon no polyps and they had to, um, uh, previously had been taking uh, polyps off and stuff like that because of the history of colon cancer in my family. But I don't have to see them for another five years, so that's good. And uh, next week I go do this, I think it's EMG test, where they t uh, test your nerves and see how much nerve damage you have going on. Because this is ordered by the uh, the next surgeon, and they they can't figure out why I'm having so much nerve 
damage and they want to see if it's carpal tunnel or it's coming from the surgery in my neck. So the only thing I hate about that EMG test is they stick these needles in you and you do bleed. You you bleed. But by me not having that much uh, sensation in my arm and in my uh, limbs, the peripheral nerve, so it, it doesn't hurt real bad. It's just the idea of looking at so much blood. But they are just going to do my... I think it's just going to do my right arm and they'll find out how much nerve damage and where the damage is coming from. But I just want to talk a little bit while I'm feeling better and got something resolved with my neighbor. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not a, a crazy woman and, and the average person would not put up with that noise. I mean, because like I say, I, I stay in my room and let him get away with a whole lot. I mean, a whole lot. They came to put in new ceiling fans last week, and the guys putting up the fans asked me, how do I put up with that? That's just how loud it was. And I told them I had reported, and nobody's done anything. So evidently, the office is finally told him about the music being so loud, but today I guess that's why he ran over here. He thought he was really getting in some trouble. But everything is is good. It's it's good when we, we can talk it out and I have to remember not to get so angry. And I don't know, I I, I do have a I don't, I don't know. I guess I could go ahead and say a short temper, a short fuse. And it's just I don't have, I have a low tolerance for ignorance. That's what it is. I know when my kids were coming up, they still say I was the meanest woman alive. But I, I, they didn't have any choices with me. And my grandmother was the same way. You didn't have, you had two choices, her way or the highway, and that was it. And I ended up be that, being that same woman, like it or lump it, because when they were getting ready, going, getting out of elementary school, I said, you're going to magnet schools, you're going this, and, and this is, I, I had a direction for them. And my oldest son hated it because he was in the football program and I made him go to the engineering magnet. I said, you're not going to have a ball in your hand all day and not have a book. So if you're going to have a ball in a book, you're going to two different schools and you're going to have to go to summer school to make up travel time. Mom, you know going to make me do it. I said, hell yeah. It's your decision. You want to play ball, but damn it, you're going to have a book in your hand. So he had to do it, but he did it. And he ended up picking up a full scholarship to SMU. I mean, a pre uh, prestigious school. I mean, the boy, just a damn genius. He didn't even have to take no SATs, none of those tests. He was just good, that good. That's just how smart he is. But hell, I, I was smart too. 140 IQ when I was in high school. But had to figure out how I'm going to pay light gas and water. Forget school. That wasn't even on the agenda. I had to figure out how I was going to live, but I didn't want my kids to have to do that. Try to figure out how you're going to live. All I want you to do is go to school and get good grades. Even my youngest son, man, we, uh, I just, you didn't have no options. I took the options away from them. And children, they, they are begging for structure because they're lost. They don't know what to do, and they want somebody to tell them what to do. And the parents are not doing it. The adults are not doing it. They, that's why they clowning and cutting up. Somebody tell me what I need to do. And we don't say nothing. And, and uh, sitting in front of the TV and watching everybody else clown and act a fool. So... They think that's what it's supposed to be like. 
And my, my youngest son, he's one of the best damn teachers in the country. And I'm bragging. Yeah, I'm wagging my tail, but teacher of the year, and you've only been at this school uh, but uh, two years, your second year. But he said, Mama, these kids, they are begging to get in my classroom because they are tired from from one classroom to the next, the chaos and the bullying. They just want to come in my classroom to get some peace and some structure. So these people need structure. We all need structure. I do too, because there are some things I, I'm supposed to do, and I know damn well I can get my ass up and do it. And when I do it, I make myself get out of this apartment and go to the store. And I say, dog, I'm so glad something kicked me and made me get out. But we have to make ourselves do things because when we're grown, it's nobody to make you do stuff. But children have to be told what they must do. But I didn't intend to get on this tangent. But anyway, let me let me share it up. But the children are begging for structure. They are. And we are the ones that have to show them what they must do. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going to get off here, guys, because this is enough. I've said enough. Bye.